Hi guys, welcome to your first flipped classroom lecture. This lecture is going to be over Ernest Hemingway's short story, Hills Like White Elephants. During the flipped classroom lecture, you're going to see information presented on the slide. You're going to hear me talk about information, and then I will also occasionally draw information on the screen as well. You need to take notes on most of it. Uh, the majority of the information I present in these lectures is things you need to take down. Uh, there are certain things I'll make sure that you know you need to take down, but then other things in uh, that are on the slides, you will just need to write them down as we go along. These notes will be graded, uh, and so it will be something that goes into the gradebook, and we'll also talk a little, about, talk a little bit about what makes good notes uh, moving forward, just so you know what to expect. So, let's get started. This right here is a picture of Ernest Hemingway. Uh, he's writing at one of his writing decks. He, uh, he wrote a lot of stuff longhand, and then would go back later, um, and type it and turn it into his actual manuscripts. Um, this is him later in life, obviously. Um, this is not necessarily Hills Like White Elephants that he's seen shown writing there, uh, but it's just a good example, or a good picture of Hemingway to start off with. So, topics covered. We're going to go over something called the Iceberg Theory. We're going to look at uh, a complex sounding but pretty simple idea, power dynamics in relationships, and we're also going to look at uh, Hemingway's sketched settings. Iceberg theory. So Hemingway believed that you could, the more you removed from a story, uh, the more powerful that story could become. And he has this uh, belief the true meaning of the piece of writing should not be evident from the surface story, but rather the crux of the story. Um, crux means important uh, our essential piece lies below the surface and should be allowed to shine through the actual story itself. Um, this was later called the theory of omission. Omission means to leave things out. And that is what the iceberg theory would have Hemingway do, where he would consciously remove things from the story leaving the reader to have to make inferences and guesses and put pieces together as a way of making the larger message more powerful. Uh, this is something that, that Hemingway consciously developed and practiced. It started from his time as a journalist, where journalism journalists needed to be able to say as much as possible in as few of lines as possible to make sure it could all fit on the page. And from this, he began to develop this idea that by saying less, he could actually convey more. He can convey a stronger idea. This is one of the most important aspects of Hemingway's writing, is this conscious effort to remove as much as possible from the story and leave the structure of the story with the meaning right below the surface. Uh, this is something we'll come back to again and again with Hemingway. So we have this picture of the iceberg here, just as kind of a visual uh, and so we want to think about if the top of this is the text, and so this is what is said. Which means that the bottom part is what is meant. The deeper meaning, we can say. Uh, which is why the picture of the iceberg is so important. Uh, it really fits quite well. As you know, icebergs, the majority of the iceberg is underneath the water. You can really only see a tiny bit above it, which is hints at the larger uh, structure below, which is really exactly what Hemingway was going for here. And so this is a good example of how Hemingway would have his text say something, but then have this huge unspoken aspect of what's going on that's beneath the surface that is just visible through certain things. Uh, the most prevalent of this is Hemingway's use of dialogue. So Hemingway's characters, as you've noticed from Hills Like White Elephants, Hemingway's characters spend a lot of time talking. His stories spend a lot of time tracking the conversation between characters because it's in that way that he's able to convey this deeper meaning in his actual stories. And so 
we always want to focus on the dialogue and see what are his characters saying and what do they actually mean by what they're saying. Power dynamics in relationships. So this is kind of complex, so bear with me here. Uh, so power dynamic is the ability to influence the decisions of other members of a relationship through rewards, threats, compromises, and trades. Um, this goes on all the time in relationships uh, between boyfriends and girlfriends and husbands and wives, and even between relationships like a boss and his employees, anything like that, even between brothers, sisters, siblings in the same family. Um, the relationship has a dynamic where whether it's the older sibling that can make the younger sibling do things they don't necessarily want to do, whether it's the boss that can make the employee work late, or whether it's members of a relationship that are able to kind of exert pressure on that actual relationship. Um, so one of the things this depends on or is important is looking at who's in charge. And in order for the power dynamic to work, there has to be a shared value. As in, I can't try to exert something from you, I can't try to make you do something if what I'm threatening you with doesn't, doesn't bother you. Um, if we don't have the same values, if we don't have the same system of, of beliefs, then it's not going to work. Now, in relationships, as it pertains to uh, adult relationships, where we're going to see this uh, most often played out is either by sex or money. Now, stereotypically, uh, you could say that it's the female that can offer the sex, and it's the male that can offer the money, and that those are the two um, powers, those are the two rewards that they can offer to the other member in order to make them do what they want. This power dynamic in relationships is something that Hemingway is incredibly interested in. Uh, he tracks it in the majority of his stories and is fascinated with how people interact with each other, with how men interact with women, the, the role that women play in those relationships, and looking at how that role can change. There are several things that can make the power dynamic shift. Uh, on a large scale, in terms of society, one of the things that can make a power dynamic shift is war. During World War I and II, all the men were off fighting. The women had to come in and take more important roles in the workplace. And as a result, the women gained power in that relationship. Uh, in terms of a, just a personal relationship, one of the things that can drastically shift a power dynamic is a pregnancy. All of a sudden, you have a huge difference in power in that the woman is now pregnant with the man's child and therefore is able to, uh, if she chooses, is able to use that as kind of leverage against the man in whatever the case may be. This power dynamics and relationship is something that we'll track again in The Sun Also Rises, uh, where we'll be looking at how the characters are interacting with each other based off of their gender and also, th also their roles in their specific relationships. Finally, the last thing is Hemingway's sketched landscapes. a little tree there, sketch a little sun, it's very nice, all right then. Uh, Hemingway sketches his landscapes with very minimal detail, and he tends to focus on just a couple things. He focuses on the presence of light or dark, whether it's daytime or nighttime or there's shadows, um, and then he also focuses on temperature. Oh, there we go. Now, apart from these details, he will give us other details at sometimes. Um, he'll generally sketch out a town and tell us just a little bit about the buildings or about the setting, about what it looks like. But the main things he focuses on are references to uh, light and dark and the temperature as well. And the reason that he does this is by just giving us the basics and giving us things that every person has interacted with. Everybody knows what shadows look like. Everybody can imagine a place that's hot or cold. The reader then injects their own information into the setting. And so Hemingway gives us just a little bit, and then we fill in the gaps between that. And there makes the setting seem more realistic because we're using our own images instead of Hemingway trying to construct the entire thing. So he really 
pushes a lot of this onto the reader. And in fact, that's one of the themes of all of the things Hemingway does, is he's a writer that makes the reader interact with the text. Uh, he really forces the reader to, to think about what's going on, to pay attention to the characters, pay attention to the dynamics, and bring in their own interpretation of the landscapes in order to make for more realistic setting because we're going to be adding in information that we think of when we think of those things, which is going to make it seem more relatable to us. So these are some of the things that Hemingway does. Uh, as a refresher, he does three things. We talked about his iceberg theory. We talked about his power dynamic and relationships, about how he's interested in how men and women interact with each other and how they get each other to do things. And then we also talked about how he sketches landscapes and makes very minimal descriptions of landscapes so that the people reading, the readers, us, will add in our own interpretations and own understandings of things. Uh, if you need to, go back and listen to this, watch this lecture again and make sure that you got all the key points. Uh, the notes that are going to be checked tomorrow, obviously, are going to make sure that you hit the topics covered. They're also going to make sure that you took down some of the things I said and not just the things that showed up on the screen. So if you need to, go back, double check your notes, and enjoy the rest of your night.